Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar, how to protect your cloud native data one-on-one. During the next hour, we're going to take a look at data in Kubernetes, what all the different paradigms, concepts, and what is required to secure your data and guarantee their operation using some of those paradigms, but also evaluating what you may need on top of that. So let's get started. My name is Nick Vermandi. I'm a principal developer advocate with OnDat. I've been working with Kubernetes approximately for the past six years on various areas such as network CNI, now more focused on the CSI. So for today, what I have in store for you is we're going to take a look at the definition of cloud native data, um, what are their characteristics, what are their you know, what may be different options for you to uh, build data uh, within the cloud, because cloud native is not necessarily only about uh, Kubernetes. But then we will switch specifically to Kubernetes, uh, talking about different concepts involving data and also extended to um, components that will help you protect your data. And finally, we'll take a look at open source solutions around data protection and also around more uh, real-time protection, things like synchronous replication, how you could eventually do this um, with Kubernetes and the CSI driver. So let's get started. What do we mean by cloud-native data? If we look at the um, Garner magic quadrant for cloud database management systems, it says that 75% of all databases will be deployed or migrated to a cloud platform with only 5% ever considered for repatriation to on-premises. So it means that most of the time, databases will be consumed as a service in the cloud, not necessarily in Kubernetes, but directly over uh, platform as a service, such as you know RDS um, and the like. It also states that by 2023, cloud preference for data management will reduce the vendor landscape while the growth in multi-cloud increases the complexity for data governance and integration. And also cloud DBMs revenue will account for 50% of the total DBMS market revenue. So Garner essentially look at um, the database and data ecosystem as merely you know, services running in the, the, the public cloud provider. But what it doesn't say is that you know, we should consider this whole cloud native database um, concept as a whole iceberg. At the top of the iceberg, this is more or less the Care Bear world where the narrative is told by the service cloud providers. Everything is easy, is naturally consumable via APIs, and uh, you basically pay for what you consume. But of course, the story is not as clean as what they say. Um, all those services are specific to particular cloud service provider. And as we know today, there's not such a thing as sticking with a single um, cloud provider. First of all, because you don't control the business. Um, you may have different merger and acquisitions, and those companies may use a different cloud than the one you have started with. And another reason may be that you may want to use a particular cloud for a particular function. If you look at maybe Google to run Kubernetes, maybe AWS to run your storage and your buckets, etc., etc. So you may want to have specialized cloud for a specific set of function you want to provide uh, to your business. And then the challenge becomes that uh, 
as you move between different clouds and reiterate, um, you know, database migration or um, operate databases into those different clouds, you even though at the end it may be you know a relational database or no SQL database, the fact is in terms of the operation, those are operated in different way because you are using different cloud providers. So it's not exactly the same API, um, but um, protecting your data will happen in a different way and how you combine this data with your overall application architecture will also be different. And typically that means that you need a broader scope in terms of the skill sets of your engineering teams, your DevOps teams, as well as your developer in the end. And on top of this, there's also two other consideration to have. The first one is about cost. When running databases services in the cloud, most of the time you will also have to account for the underlying running instances that are powering your database. So Mainly, this means you will have to pay for the compute, so the, the running instance, as well as the storage. For example, your LBS volume associated, associated to your database. That's one. And the second consideration to have is about availability. As you probably know, most of the cloud database are replicated and highly available within a particular availability zone. As soon as you want to recover into a different availability zone, then it does incur some downtime. Potentially, you have to uh, restore for snapshots. And that also means you have to schedule and manage the lifecycle of those snapshots by yourself. And chances are that your snapshot may not be um, you know, restorable as a destination. So on top of that, you would have to test your backup on a regular basis, which is obviously causing some overhead on top of your, um, you know, operations. And again, this is for one particular cloud. If you consume this database as a service model from different clouds, you would have to repeat the same sort of automation and uh, extended operation over multiple cloud and you know automating snapshot testing the restore of those snapshots in different cloud will also uh, involve different skill sets because they are using different api different sdks uh, different provider if we're talking about infrastructure as code and you know, talking about um, DevOps pipeline, for example. So all of this needs to be um, taken in. And if we compare this to a, let's say, cloud native Kubernetes solution, then there will be a couple of differences. So let's first take a look at the cloud native features, what we could expect from a Kubernetes environment, whether running on premises or in the public cloud, managed or unmanaged. First, it's all about scalability. The last couple of years have seen the raise of auto scaling for pods, but also auto scaling for nodes. So this means that um, as your application requires more power, you can also deploy more nodes in Kubernetes. As you would do with a auto scaling group um, in, in public cloud providers as well. So not only for uh, nodes, but also for the application itself. So you can scale your application um, to be able to take, you know, taking some of the, the peaks during um, high usage periods, such as, you know, uh, promotion, sales, if it's that's a commercial application, or during Black Friday, for example, where potentially you need, you, you need more power for your application, so more web servers, uh, maybe more database nodes to facilitate uh, reads, but also more Kubernetes compute nodes as well. Elasticity, so that is the ability to scale up 
but also down where when you don't need this uh, this extra power self healing is also a very important um, concept in kubernetes whereby Kubernetes is fundamentally an asynchronous system with eventual consistency where things happen um, concurrently and will eventually converge to a finite state. So even though um, things may not succeed the first time, maybe the second time uh, a controller will try to do something, all the prerequisites will be met by, you know, if it depends on other controllers and in the end eventually everything will converge sort of you know self-healing itself observability is also key in kubernetes there are you know a proliferation of solutions like prometheus grafana different dashboards that are available uh, within kubernetes i would say you know at no extra costs so this is also a very important factor so this is for the basic, the foundation of Kubernetes and wh what kind of requirements and capability it is uh, providing. But how about persistent data and storage? Let's say if you want to build your own um, database in Kubernetes and run it in production, then first off, of course, it needs to be distributed. You can run, not run a single pod database on a single node. You want to have a distribution of your data across multiple replicas, across different Kubernetes nodes. Uh, you want replication to happen as well, uh, because by default, we're going to see later uh, some of the Kubernetes primitives, but the data itself is not replicated by the platform. So meaning that there are two main solutions. You can replicate your data at the application level, meaning that you rely on your database cluster or your database replicas to provide um, multiple instances of the same data. Or uh, alternatively, you can also rely on your storage provider or CSI driver um, to provide that particular feature or of replicating at the block level. And I'm going to talk um, a little bit about this later as well. Encryption is also something you have to consider, especially if you're running um, database that, that are holding sensitive data. End-to-end -end encryption is really important in Kubernetes, um, and you have to find the right solution, which is not necessarily relying only on the cloud provider for encryption. You may also want to encrypt your data directly uh, inside Kubernetes so that no one can get access to your uh, Kubernetes volume if someone were to you know, read it from, um, from Kubernetes itself. And another very important um, function for your developer is self-service provisioning. So the idea here is as you know, microservices become more and more popular, individual teams are responsible for you know, a set of microservices. And each one of these teams will run their own queuing or messaging system and their own databases. And you can simply, you know, in the, let's say, uh, cloud native philosophy, you cannot rely on a waiting time for developer to consume and to provision their databases. They need to be uh, deployed on demand. You cannot afford you know, waiting two, three, four, or four days or even multiple weeks to get the database up and running in an environment where potentially code updates um, and new releases are deployed in production typically multiple times a day. So self-provisioning self is a very important concept when it comes to um, deploying and managing databases in, in, in Kubernetes. And because Kubernetes has all the fundamental prerequisites to enable this kind of paradigms, it makes it 
a the perfect platform to run databases. And finally, all the functions we have been mentioning so far can be encapsulated into DevOps pipelines. And again, you have two solutions. Either you could use your cloud service provider uh, native service, such as Azure pipelines and, and others. Um, and of course, you will be subject to the same um, drawbacks, I would say, that we've seen before in terms of you know, different clouds having different APIs and different way of implementing those DevOps pipelines. Or alternatively, you can choose to stay within Kubernetes um, and use a Kubernetes native DevOps tool, such as Tekton, uh, which gives you the ability to um, develop your DevOps pipeline without leaving Kubernetes. Basically, every task um, defined in your DevOps pipeline in Tekton um, is run as a distinct container. So you can compose your pipeline as you wish, again, using YAML, which is the de facto language, declarative language in Kubernetes. So again, no need to, le to learn anything, anything new. Just using YAML, you can define your different action, your different tasks, and those tasks can communicate to each other by using you know, also your storage inside Kubernetes and essentially run the whole pipeline without leaving your cluster, meaning that as you deploy Kubernetes as your de facto cloud operating system, you can stay consistent across all different clouds in terms of building your applications, but also building your um, DevOps practice. So now let's take a look at some of the Kubernetes data primitives. The most important primitive when it comes to uh, persistent data in Kubernetes and non-persistent data actually, is Kubernetes volumes. And Kubernetes supports a variety um, of volumes. For this, you can use kubectl to get access to the whole descriptions as usual. So kubectl explain pod.spec.volume dash dash recursive will give you the full list of supported volumes. Some of them are uh, legacy, I would say, because it also include the deprecated entry drivers. But Kubernetes has moved away from the entry drivers into a more modular approach where every storage vendor or provider um, develop its own driver called CSI or Container Storage Interface. It's a pluggable architecture where only the required CSI uh, will be installed by the user when you need it. So for example, if you're using Amazon EKS, you can install the EBS CSI driver. And so uh, you will be able to take advantage of a, a variety of feature that comes with the CSI. So all the Kubernetes primitives and on top of that, um, also additional capabilities. The main volume providers um, you're going to be using are displayed here um, on the screen. The first and more obvious one is the persistent volume claim. So a persistent volume claim is a request for a backend persistent volume that matches specific criteria, such as you know, the size, the storage class um, of the, the volume you want to create. Um, essentially, when you create a PVC, two things may happen. The first one, if your CSI can provision dynamically persistent volume, well, when you create a PVC in the backend, a persistent volume or PV is dynamically created. Um, if the CSI doesn't support um, dynamic creation of, of PV, then you have to statically link your persistent volume claim with the backend persistent volume that has to be created before. Uh, but nowadays, most of the, the CSI driver support um, the, the, the dynamic provisioning of persistent volume. And typically, what you will do is create a particular storage class, defining uh, the type of storage you want to use and the CSI you want to use. 
um, and then reference that particular storage class in the PVC definition as well as the size. Uh, and then the backend persistent volume will be automatically created. Another important consideration is how the pod will access the PVCs. So if you have a single pod, um, you can have a PVC that is locally attached. Uh, if the node fail, then unfortunately, you will also lose the data. Now, if uh, you create a higher level construct, such as a deployment, um, then you will have to use a shared file system because in the definition of your deployment, you will specify a single PVC, meaning that if the PVC is a local attached um, file system, then only the first pod uh, will be able to consume it. Right? The other pods that will be potentially residing on the same host won't be able to access it because it's been already claimed by uh, the first one. And pods that are residing on other nodes, well, they won't have access to the local um, attached volume. Right. So the only solution is to have a shared network file system if you need multiple pods part of a deployment to access a, um, a particular PVC, and then you have the option to uh, create a particular directory per pod basis. So you, you will have a shared file system, and every pod uh, that have access that has access to that particular PVC will create uh, or will use its own directory. So in terms of access definition, it means that if you want to use a PVC uh, within a deployment and every pod need to write to that PVC, you will need to use a read-write many access backed by something like an NFS share. Other volumes that um, can be used include mtdir, which is a scratch directory typically mounted from the root file system or RAM uh, on the node. It starts empty um, and of course the pod may write um, data to the directory that will be mounted into it. But when the pod is restarted, the data that is located there is um, also scratched. Then host pass, which identifies a particular path um, in the Kubernetes node that will be mounted um, as a volume into the pod. It is typically avoided um, in production um, as it has some security involvements, but also because it's only valid for naked pods. Again, if you create a higher level um, construct managed by a controller, such as a deployment, a stateful set, etc., cetera, um, then it doesn't make sense to use a um, host path, right? So typically used for testing or troubleshooting eventually. Then we have config map, uh, which are a set of key value pairs that can be mounted to your pod as environment variables, but also as a volume um, into the pod. And then your application can, can, um, access, can get access to this information just by reading the files that will be present into uh, your uh, mount point. Secrets, sort of similar to config map, except that it is encoded in base 64, but not encrypted by default. This is really important. Then we have the downward um, API, which can be very useful because it provides contextual information for your application running inside your pod. So the downward API allows you uh, so to define uh, in YAML again uh, inside your pod. You can reference particular fields you want um, to inject into uh, your running pod. So it can be things like you know, your pod IP, uh, the amount, um, you know, the requests uh, for your CPU, the limits of the CPU memory, etc. So give essentially a lot of contextual information uh, for your application as opposed to you know, hard code um, those information. And finally, we have also ephemer ephemeral volumes which are a bit more recent than the, the others. Um, and they have been created to meet the requirement of uh, specific use cases where application don't really care if the attached volumes 
are persistent or not. So for example, it may be um, a caching application um, where the data you know, can be easily uh, scratched when the pod gets restarted and the application doesn't really care, or care about that. Or it gives also the ability to pre-populate data as input for the application. But uh, essentially, the main difference is that the life cycle of the volume is uh, the same as the one of the pod, meaning that um, the pod can get restarted on a node where previously the volume didn't reside, as opposed to, as opposed to a PVC, for example, as the PVC, once it's been claimed, will basically reside forever on a particular node. It means that the pod is tied to uh, the specific the specific node where the PVC resides. So it cannot be restarted on another node. Here, the difference is that pods can be restarted on whatever nodes. Also, in addition, ephemeral volumes can be supported by um, CSI providers to deliver um, some additional capabilities such as um, snapshotting, cloning, resizing, and um, uh, storage capacity tracking for those ephemeral volumes because they are uh, fundamentally CSI capabilities. Okay, so now let's focus a little bit more on the CSI basic capabilities. What does a CSI need to deliver to Kubernetes at the bare minimum? So it is a standard defined for storage plugins in 2018 when uh, Kubernetes moved from the entry uh, driver development, meaning that for every modification, um, the whole Kubernetes system had to be replaced. Um, so moving away from this entry to a more pluggable architecture where um, you, know, you don't need to replace the whole Kubernetes system just to update or upgrade your CSI driver. So essentially now the CSI driver um, is delivered as an additional application that you installed um, inside uh, Kubernetes as you deploy the cluster. So the CSI driver need to uh, be compliant with a couple of APIs or RPCs that will deliver um, specific function to Kubernetes or function that Kubernetes expects. So dynamic provisioning and the provisioning of a volume, attaching or detaching a volume from a node, mounting and mounting volume from nodes, also support the creation and also deletion of snapshots, and finally also provisioning a new volume from a snapshot. Those are typically um, the features that the any CSI will deliver. Now, as I was saying before, the CSI driver itself is installed as an application on your Kubernetes cluster and has typically multiple components. Um, so the node plugin, typically delivered as a daemon set, um, holding a gRPC endpoint. Then we have the controller plugin, also a gRPC endpoint. And then the CSI driver has uh, multiple interfaces, one responsible for identity, the identity services, the controller services, and uh, finally, the node service. Now, when it comes to data protection, the CSI driver uh, deliver multiple functions that are represented as an extension of the Kubernetes APIs. Snapshots are effectively represented as CRDs or custom resource definitions and are composed of three main objects. First, the volume snapshot, the volume snapshot content, and finally, the volume snapshot class. So the volume snapshots is comparable to a PVC in the sense that it is actually a request for a snapshot, a real snapshot. And that snapshot that is taken is effectively similar to a persistent volume in the sense that it is effectively the physical 
uh, sort of snapshots and the corresponding object is the volume snapshot content. Um, the volume snapshot is composed of a snapshot controller as well as a validation webhook and is effectively delivered by uh, the CSI driver. So the snapshot controller watches both volume snapshot and volume snapshot content, and it's the component responsible for the creation and the deletion of volume snapshot objects. On the other side, um, the sidecar CSI snapshotter is the um, component that watches volume snapshot content objects and that triggers create snapshots as well as delete snapshot operations against a particular CSI endpoint. And finally, um, the validation webhook is nothing more but a HTTP callback that is there uh, with the goal of um, tightening the validation for volume object snapshot. And um, finally, we also have the volume snapshot class, which specifies different attributes belonging to a volume snapshot. It is sort of similar to a storage class if you want to compare volume snapshots to PVC again. One other thing to notice is that the volume snapshot content, similarly to a persistent volume, can be provisioned um, dynamically or um, can be pre-existing. So for snapshots, pre-provision or already existing mean that you can link a volume snapshot object, again, which is the request, to an existing snapshot that has been taken maybe by your storage array. So effectively representing the external snapshot taken from the storage array uh, into a Kubernetes first-class citizen. But most of the time, of course, um, if the CSI driver supports it, when you will create a volume snapshot, the corresponding uh, real snapshot, the physical snapshot will be created and will correspond to the volume snapshot content. So obviously, snapshots are asynchronous. That means they represent um, at a particular um, time the content of the data. Um, it's not a synchronous replication that is ha happening uh, continuously over time. And that may be an issue um, in case of um, RPO that needs to be equal to zero. So RPO or recovery point objective is the representation of the data that you can afford losing in case of um, failure, right? So if you have an RPO equal to zero, it means that you need something um, more synchronous than a snapshot. Basically, you need a representation, a continuous representation of your data over time. And this is the type of thing that are not um, or cannot be represented directly or are not available directly in Kubernetes. But by using particular CSI drivers that can uh, produce and provide actually that feature on top of the additional um, functions that are required by the Kubernetes API, well, the CSI driver can itself deliver synchronous replication. So this is the case of the on that CSI uh, that is represented here on the screen, uh, but other open source uh, CSI drivers um, like OpenEBS can also support replication. It's just to give you an example of how it can be delivered. So the idea here is to provide this additional capability um, by giving the user the ability to configure as YAML or in a declarative format to configure the number of replicas on a per volume basis so that 
when a node fail, even though the storage is locally attached, it's effectively aggregated um, as a pool of available storage. And every volume that is um, consumed within that pool is also replicated on a set of other nodes. So when the node fails, the pod can be restarted on another node where the volume replicas can in turn be uh, promoted as the new, um, the new primary volume. And this is what will enable you to uh, seamlessly recover in case of node failure with effectively zero data loss. Okay, so, so far we've seen different paradigms, snapshots, asynchronous, synchronous replication for zero RPO, but uh, fundamentally there is also something else which is creating backup from your snapshot. So your snapshots as such um, are living within Kubernetes. So in case of failure, of course, if you want to restore, um, you need to restore from a storage repository that is still available. So typically, you want to externalize your snapshot and copy um, the data into an external storage repository like AWS S3 or um, Google Storage. And again, you can do these operations without leaving Kubernetes with, again, the same principle, leveraging controllers, CRDs, and the operator model. So in our particular example, we'll take a look at Canister, which is an open tool by an open source tool by um, Kasten and is effectively composed of CRDs, a controller, as well as a command line that we're going to explore in a minute. At the center of the Canister architecture, we have multiple CRDs, including the blueprint, which is a custom resource defined as a set of instructions that tell the canister controller how to perform action on a specific application. They are typically a curated set of manifests that are maintained by the community. So every application will have a corresponding blueprint that will encapsulate actions such as how to quiz the file system or the database, etc. Then, as another set of custom resources, um, we have action sets, which define actions that can be triggered by the creation of the corresponding you know, uh, custom resource manifests. So typically, if you want to do a backup or a restore actions, you will do that by creating those manifests. And to help with um, the life cycle of those uh, custom resources, you can also use a command line called canctl, um, which can be used in dry mode to generate the different manifests. And then those manifests can be um, applied to the Kubernetes cluster using kubectl, or you can just use canctl without the dry run option and um, it will directly create those CRDs into your Kubernetes cluster. So here we have an example um, for the Elasticsearch application. The first thing you're going to do uh, in the workflow is to create a profile that encapsulates the information required to create um, a remote uh, storage location. In that particular example, uh, we are using GCP and um, cloud storage to externalize the data that we are going to back up from Elasticsearch. So it encapsulates the information required to configure the external bucket as well as the corresponding credentials. Then once the profile has been created, um, you're going to create um, the blueprint that is available um, you know, publicly that is really specific to Elasticsearch and define how to perform action on that particular application. Then we can use canctl with dry run mode uh, to generate the, the, the manifest for the backup action set and later 
apply it with kubectl, or here in the example, we just use canctl without the dry run mode, um, and that will directly create and push the manifest into your Kubernetes cluster. So here we specify the action set as backup. We specify the blueprint that we just created. Uh, we specify the stateful set that is basically representing the application that we want to back up. So default Elasticsearch master represent the um, namespace and the name of the stateful set. And finally, we also reference the profile that defines where we want to store our backup content. So once the action set has been created, the manifest push to Kubernetes, the controller will react to that and trigger effectively a backup um, that you, um, you can monitor in terms of the status using kubectl as well. So just monitoring that particular custom resource, you will see uh, once um, you will be updated once the, the, the backup has been completed. And then in case of um, disaster, you um, and you want to restore the content of, um, of the remote location, then again, you can just use canctl as displayed here on the screen, specify uh, the namespace, create the action set. This time the action set is restore. And from the backup name, which is uh, basically the name that has been uh, returned by the previous command when uh, triggering the backup action set. And again, uh, it's a CRDs. You can monitor the progress of the restore by using kubectl to monitor uh, the status of that particular CRDs. And at some point, the data, the initial data will be restored um, in the right place. So that concludes our presentation for today. Uh, hopefully you learned something and it's been useful. A uh, couple of key takeaways um, before moving on. Kubernetes is ready for a stateful application with cloud native data. This is a very important point. It has evolved over time. So now it's not only about cattle, you can also run pets in Kubernetes. But the key is to make sure that you can reach the right level of availability scale and performance. And we've addressed today some of uh, the challenges for persistent storage. And as you've seen, they are not all addressed by default in Kubernetes, especially when it comes to zero RPO and synchronous replication. And even when you have um, a CSI driver that can provide snapshots, you also need to backup those snapshot those snapshots into a remote location and this is where you may want to use again um, a kubernetes native tool such as um, canisters or valero or others and this is made possible by extending kubernetes for data protection and making data protection first class citizen in kubernetes thanks to the ability of kubernetes to extend its APIs. So finally, you want to make sure that your CSI driver can protect your can protect your stateful workloads in case of node failure or also cloud outage and possibly avail availability zone outage too. Now, a call to actions for you. Um, if you want to learn more about data on Kubernetes and how to run uh, your stateful application and your stateful workload in Kubernetes, please join the DOK or Data on Kubernetes community. You have the link there. I'm personally running the DOK London Meetup. So if you're local uh, to the UK, you can go and subscribe to the Meetup page so that you are um, always up to date when it comes to the next dates for our Meetup. The next one will be it's in uh, September, so if you're local, don't hesitate to join us. Um, also, if you want to learn more about on that and on our CSI capabilities, you have a set of links there that you can go to for more information. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I wish you um, a good day and take care of yourself. <laughs>
See you next time.